Russell Harty Program, Part 1. Production number 2927, date of recording 18 12 75, take 1. Tonight we're flying to Los Angeles to meet Elton John and in a moment we should be leaving Heathrow Airport with his mother and stepfather and their next door neighbours and several of Elton's aunts and uncles, all guests on Rock of the Westies Express, the jetliner specially chartered to take them and all the Elton John office staff to Los Angeles to see Elton perform live at the huge Dodger Stadium before 55,000 people. This is a film record of a trip I took with them all a week or so ago, so sit back and fly high with us on our Sharabang in the Sky. Along with Elton John's family, mother and stepfather, there are his friends, his lawyers and his accountants, his gardeners and his next door neighbours. And all of us fed on steak Diane and champagne with a travel pack of jokes and puzzles and cameras and sticks of rock to keep us busy between in-flight meals and movies as we head westward over the Canadian Rockies and turn left down to Los Angeles. I went to ask Elton's mother if her son will be there to meet us. Well, I don't know. I'm hoping so. Do you ever know what he's be... doing from one minute to no. the next? No, I'm always the last one to know. Everybody else tells me what he's doing. How often does he call you? Oh, about once every couple of months. No, it's, it's great, really, when he doesn't call, because if he doesn't call, there's nothing wrong. So when he doesn't call, I'm, everything's going OK. Does he ever call worry. you if there is anything wrong? Yes. Yeah, if there's anything wrong, I'm always the first one to know then. Or if, if anything great happened, you know, like the record's number one or something like that, then he rings. Does he need you still for any kind of emotional help? Well, I suppose like all sons need mothers, really. We could be pretty close, really, yes. Meeting <laughs> <laughs> arrivals from England. <laughs> And when the family peckings and the friendly greetings are all over, everybody, including our track-suited host, slips into their Cadillacs and Rolls Royces and slides off to bed. Dawn, Los Angeles. The warm Californian sun rises over the mammoth Dodger baseball stadium, still quiet and waiting to be shattered by the thousand decibels of Elton John's joyful music.
By mid-morning, the youthful pilgrimage has begun. Meanwhile, the privileged guests from England prepare for a morning on the town, as down on the Avenue of the Stars, the city of Los Angeles prepares to honor Elton John in its own extravagant way. With Elton John, where is he? Where is he? Half of our party had driven down to the Pacific shoreline for a trip round the bay in the host's hulking great yacht, appositely named after one of Elton's many successful albums, Madman Across the Water. It comes complete with a permanent crew on the end of a radio telephone, ready to roll out when the call comes, perhaps one weekend every year. present a proclamation which declares this week Elton John Week. <laughs> being British to have my star on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> Lift it up. Okay. All right. All right. Let's take it away. There it is. Look up at it. The other half of the party are boarding the glamour tram at Universal Film Studios to take the conducted tour around Kojak's office and Colombo's caravan. The trail is the monster's house. It had a strange fence around it. Strange trees out front, but whoa, there's the monsters, monsters out. You see that theater over there on Ralph's side? If you saw Earthquake. That's where the Clint Eastwood movie was showing at the start of the earthquake. Well, this street was destroyed in Earthquake, also transformed into Chicago for the sting. Ralph, no, we can't go to the bridge. The thing is falling apart. <laughs> This carefully designed collapsing bridge catches a lot of the aunts and uncles unawares, but it's the working model of the horror from the Hollywood Wax Museum that makes the most lasting impression on Auntie Peg. <laughs> and when all the morning shocks and shivers are over, it's back into yet another special boss, and off to the Dodger Stadium. Do you know we've been waiting for ten minutes for you? You know we can't, Elton can't start without his mother there. You always have to wait for the best things. Do the best things come last? Come on, darling. On you go. What did you do last night then? Went out with some friends, went down the strip, had a look at the star. We went up to Beverly Hills for the hamburger in. Do you have a lot of friends here? Quite a few, yes, I mean quite a few friends I mean friends you've met through Elton? Yes, yeah. Well, they're all friends of mates, really. Wait a minute. What is that? Is it, it's That's heavy, is it yeah, gold? gold yeah. Yes, it is. Would that be a present from the generous Elton John? That is. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. Has he bought you lots of things? Loads of things, yeah. What, like what? Jewelry. Oh, are they real so rocks, many. these? Yes, they are. <laughs> I bet you're very heavily insured as well. Quite heavily. <laughs> I like the way you wear rocks and a t-shirt side by side. Oh, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> At the stadium, the concert has already started. There are two lengthy performances from supporting artists before Elton John ever appears. At this moment, he's still at home, getting himself ready. But the family group make their way to the turnstiles to be checked through and receive their top priority tickets. Apart from Elton's family, there's John Reed's mother and father and Auntie Peg, still slightly shell-shocked from her ordeal at the hands of that monster. I've been stabbed. What? <laughs> no, how about this? And there are four hours to go yet, you see.
up. I'm going to bring him How from many uh, got all together? St Stepaniacs. Well, it depends. By the time Elton John goes on, we'll probably have about 60 men around the front of the stage area, and uh, we'll have another 40 or 50 inside the area, and probably another 30. Do you expect any trouble? No, we don't expect any trouble. But we're more of a preventative nature than a uh, reactionary. Hey. Rock and roll. And then Elton's on his way here. How so do you know that? You know that through that, do you? Right. Do you know where he is at this moment? Not at this moment. We know he left his house probably about 10 minutes ago. This is just a connection with the whole entire setup of Dodger Stadium, so we know what's coming off and when, where, what date gates are opening, if problems arise, and so forth and so on. And it seems to be extraordinary cool and calm and unhysterical. And totally it's run happy. very, very well. Extremely well, and we're real pleased. And the crowd seemed controlled and cool and right. careful. It got kind of nervous about 6.30 in the morning, but it settles down real quick. And we got great weather. And... What treasures are in here? It's an L.A. Dodgers outfit. They, they sent one down, and Bob Mackey, who makes all of Elton's clothes, made this one up. And it's just like a Dodger suit, only it's all sequined it up. tight fitting? Yeah, it fits tight in the legs. Your feet go through there. Your feet go through there, and then you wear your tennis shoes and your socks, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, and then he's got this hat to wear with it. Cute. Did you have difficulty persuading Dodger to let you use the stadium? For this yes, hat? we did. Uh, the last show they had here was like 10 years ago. With? With uh, the Beatles, where they did uh, 42,000 people, and they had a near, well, some people say a riot. And after that, the uh, people who owned Dodger Stadium said, that's it. And uh, it was 10 years, and uh, to make a long story short, people said the best place to play Los Angeles is Dodger Stadium, but you can't get it. So we called up, and it took us about six months, and we got it. My name is Russell Harty. I've heard <laughs> such a lot about you. Yes, how are you? You're a special servant for the day. Yes, no, bus boy. Bus boy? Bus boy. What does that mean? I bus the tables. So you people think it's a concert here. It's actually a lunch with a concert. But I'm the busboy. I clean up everything here. I've been working the stadium for years. And we're, how many we have today? 250? 250. 250 we, we feed. How often? And then I'm joining the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus the 1st of December. As a what? That's what they're trying to figure out. <laughs> but we're going to, you know, the whole thing is my, my whole family were caterers. Were they? Yes. On your mother's side? Yes, don't do anything on the rug. You see, these rugs come up at 5 o'clock. <laughs> it's silly. Hello. <laughs> Can I go get my beer on the ice? Yeah. You do exactly what you want. You're, this is your... Who's playing this here is today? E. John. E. John who? E. John Elton John. Oh. Have you heard of him before? No. Do they dance or what? The girls? And absolutely on time, the sleek motorcade bringing the band and songwriter Bernie Torpin, together with manager Reed and Elton himself, slips off Sunset Boulevard and purrs to a halt in the private car park where a wagon train of luxury caravans had drawn themselves up around a very private patch of plastic grass, this. the green room for this big event. One day. <laughs> Robin Hood and Little John Reed, just before the capture of Dodger Stadium. This is the moment when the star's nerves are most exposed. The entourage which has escorted him across Los Angeles and those who have been preparing to receive him know that this is the time when they should respect a certain distance. At this moment, Elton gravitates towards the man who knows him and his moods best, John Reed. Five minutes. Move. <laughs> in a few moments, Elton has to justify the faith placed in him by 55,000 fans and this high-geared organization around him. I find it very strange that all this is, is just for one person, isn't it? Oh, I don't really think of it until he comes on stage. Then I think about it. But there's so much going on here at the moment. Too. Yeah, but the, every single person who's here, like having a good time, is here because of your love. Does that not? It would make me... Yeah, it does. Well, in, no, does, not until yeah. he comes on stage. Oh, you've got something. When he comes something on stage, about, yeah. it, it, You've got a feeling about it, anyhow, when you see them all. So it really, does, no, it really doesn't affect me until he comes out on stage. And then what? And, well, you it depends wild. what he starts with. It's either we're screaming or we're crying. Well, that's a <laughs> <laughs> Who 
you don't know you feel proud? Check, check. Well, of course, yes, of course it does. I feel more proud at the end when I know everything's gone off all right. That's when I feel more proud. Do you have butterflies? I do a bit, yes. Well, you must be getting used to it now. It's oh, yes. Regular well, I, I have butterflies, but then I know that he doesn't worry about anything. If I thought that he was nervous, then I would be a bundle of nerves. But he, he just seems to... Well, let's face it, he loves what he's doing, doesn't he? He doesn't have to worry about it. Russell Hartley, Hearty Program, Part 2. Pardon? Production number 2927, date of recording 1812.75, take 1.
On the morning after the first concert, when the first press reviews came in, we had breakfast in the garden of Elton's house, perched on a hillside overlooking Los Angeles, that same house which once belonged to Greta Garbo. We took our choice of tea and coffee and champagne, and I asked him whose idea it had been to fly out his family and his friends. No, I, it, was, um, it was a total shock for me. I mean, I, I don't take much credit for it myself, um, even though I'll probably get the bill. Um, <laughs> no, that's untrue, Fox. Uh, it, was jo it was John's idea, my manager, John Reed, and I think it's a great idea to sort of import the whole office over and give them what they work really hard. Uh, the office in London and everybody from like the accountants down to the fan club, the girls who run the fan club, and relations and lawyers and people like that have all come over. And they can't, they, they still can't believe they're here. It's a bit weird to come. I mean, some of them have been as far as Clacton, you know, and all of a sudden they're in the midst of all the palm trees and going to Grauman's Chinese Theatre and having hot dogs and things like that. And seeing you with 55,000 people. Well, they saw me at Wembley with 72, so that, I don't think that makes that... I, I just think they're just knocked out to be in Hollywood, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's very impressive. I mean, when I first came here, I was impressed. Are you still impressed by any of it? Um, well, it wears thinner after time. I, I mean, I like, I like Los Angeles a lot. People knock it for its plastic, you know, it's false and it's phony. But if you know that, and, and you, then... That's all you have to worry it about. takes, though, doesn't it? One, it takes a very strong imaginative effort to actually put yourself into a trashy scene and enjoy it. Um, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. No, I mean, if I would, I'm adaptable for any occasion. Um, no, I, I think you just have to get. I mean, I like Los Angeles. I could nowhere li live here all the time. I mean, my roots are firmly entrenched in England because I think if I lived here full time, I think it would gradually get to the. Uh, sort of, it's a very slow pace, and a lot of, mu of American musicians aren't. don't push themselves as hard as they should. I, I don't think anyway. They, you know, they, they, they're very slow in their output, uh, which people will say, well, so they should be, you know, you put too much out and you're not selective enough. Yeah. But um, I disagree. I think a lot of American musicians lose their way a lot. And I think it, it's, I don't know, there's something about England, even though the audiences are much quieter and, and less responsive, that breeds um, ambition and drive amongst musicians. It's, it's, ama it's amazing. I think it's because of, uh, when you grow up as a, as a child, uh, over here, you, I mean, you, you're all, everybody usually has a car when they're 16. Now, I never had a pair of roller skates till I was 23. You know, I mean, and you know, you have to struggle and... and you didn't have hush puppies either, did you? No, I couldn't have hush, hush, hush puppies. Can you believe it? Um, no more, no mohair sweaters? No, no, none of those awful pink and mauve ones. Do you remember, you from Carnaby mm. Street. Mm. I was forbidden to go down Carnaby Street. Do you imagine anything <laughs> so daft? Uh, <laughs> oh, you can't go down there. <laughs> Den of iniquity. All those old soldiers' uniforms they're wearing. <laughs> Bloody moth-eaten rubbish. <laughs> but didn't that tempt you to want to go up? Didn't you sneak down? Mm? No. Never. Well, I could never get into the clothes anyway, so it would depress me. <laughs> so, um... What, were you, what did you look like? Were you round? I sort of looked like, um... a young Reginald Maudling, I would say. <laughs> when breakfast was finished, Elton had to go and change for his second big day at Dodgers Stadium. The morning's favourable press reviews had drawn attention to the enormous electricity generated by the crowds the day before. And while Elton was getting unhooked from our smaller batteries, I talked about that highly charged atmosphere with the man who most closely shares Elton's musical triumphs, lyric writer Bernie Taupin. I, I, I think we all just came back uh, to Elton's house and nobody really said anything. Everybody was so sort of drained and emotional by the whole thing that everybody just sat there sort of like this. And so I just, we just went home and uh, watched television. <laughs> but the thing was, the funniest thing about it was that it was an afternoon concert. And by the time we got home, it was only like 7 o'clock. And it felt like it was 2 o'clock in the morning, mm. which was very strange. Have you ever cried at a concert? No, I haven't, actually. I've, I've been near to it. I mean, I came pretty near to it on Sunday. Uh, I get a large lump in my throat and so sort of the eyes well up a bit, but I've, I've never actually shed tears. I mean, and that's, and as I say, I've only got very emotional on a couple of occasions. And I think they've always been in L.A. For some reason, L.A.'s, uh, we've had some of our best dates here, you know. <laughs>
Elton is back in Dodger Stadium, socking it to 55,000 more fans, serenading them on this warm Californian afternoon down the yellow brick road. There's a legend that, that there isn't really an Elton John, it's, it's you. <laughs> you're, you're the real Elton John. I'm having those made up in leaflets and dropping them over the city. From aeroplanes? <laughs> yes. In, in all major cities? Yeah, that, that, that was hysterical. That comes from a, a very, very bad taste American uh, newspaper, which sort of middle America and, and lonely housewives read. I won't, be, I won't mention the name, I'll probably get sued, so I better be careful. Mm. But it was, a, <laughs> it was an article that came out when um, Elton had uh, split up the old band and uh, was forming the new one and it was all terribly inaccurate anyway because it said he'd fired all the band which was untrue because two of them had left and uh, we'd still got the rest of the members but uh, it ended by <laughs> by saying that uh, the only person he would never get rid of was me because he couldn't survive without me and he was my puppet and without without Bernie Elton is nothing which, which he phoned me up and read to me over the phone. And we got copies of it and had them blown up and distributed to a close friend. I wonder if the lady who wrote that knows that <coughs> it's now sitting over Elton's uh, mantel, mantel oh, she, yeah, she was probably in all seriousness, you know, when she wrote it. And I'm sure if she saw it, she'd be uh, a little taken back to see it over everybody's mantelpiece. Maybe Jenny. there's someone to present it. John Reed is the man who completes this triumvirate. He rarely allows the limelight to spill onto himself. His main concern is that things should go well. He flits from continent to continent ahead of the circus, ensuring that all the wheels are well oiled and that the sawdust is spread perfectly around the ring. Yeah, we need some news. Elton trusts his judgment totally, which allows him to joke at John's expense regularly. Although John likes to see his name mentioned in the Glasgow pay for it once every three months as being the richest man that Scotland's ever produced. <laughs> um, I think Bernie comes off worse than me. I, th I, have, I've, I feel sorry for Bernie in, in a lot of senses. If there is any criticism hurled at me, and there is often a lot of criticism hurled at me, it's there's, uh, Bernie usually has, has to take more criticism than I do. So um, Without the applause? Without the applause. and and. I don't think he gets enough share of the limelight, and uh, I won't let him. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you use your, yours or John's yacht? Well, he goes on it quite a bit because he like, you know, I mean, he likes sort of driving it around and things. I don't understand that. I'm a bit frightened of the sea, and after seeing Jaws, I should probably never go right near a beach again. Um, I never have the time, quite honestly. I'd rather play tennis and go sort of out on the boat. I mean, after five minutes, I, s I say, well, what else does it do? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so, so it floats, so. Uh, you know. <laughs> Ducks float. You know. uh, <laughs> so I'm a bit like that on holiday, you know. I sit out on the beach after ten minutes and I say, well, well, what, what, what's, what's going to happen next? <laughs> Very restless. That's why you know, people say I work too hard. It's because I get so bored doing nothing. You, do you bore awfully easy? Oh, terribly, yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, I'm not 
you're short and fat and awkward, or, or, or so you claim to be, and yet here you are, perhaps the world's now currently most successful pop star. Is there a message of hope to all, all those people who are similarly inclined and ambitious? Yeah, well, I hope... <laughs> well, I mean, it, just to... Yeah, I mean, any, if, you, if you're ambitious enough, you can make it... In a, I've always said that ambition is something that you're born with, and it doesn't matter what shape you are. If you're ambitious and you want to succeed, you will succeed. Um, I'm still ambitious, even though I'm supposedly the number one, as you said, rock star at the moment, which I, I, always, I never think of myself as anyway, because I always think things can get better. I mean, for example, the new band's been together and it's done about 24 engagements so far. I mean, a couple of funerals, we played a couple of bar mitzvahs, <laughs> and, you know, you know, we're gradually getting into it. <laughs>
The sun has gone down over the Californian hills and the powerful floodlights at Dodger Stadium have lit up the multitudes who've trekked in from the San Fernando Valley and beyond to turn on to Elton John. Great grandchildren of the Californian gold rush, staking their own claims in a phenomenal 20th century gold mine, Elton John. Thank you, Los Angeles. Thank you, the Dodgers. I've been watching your mother closely for a week. And it's all untrue, folks. And it, as well as obviously having a very good time, which she is, and as well as obviously being looked after, which she is, it occurred to me, t driving here today, that she must have new sets of problems now. Yeah, um, everyone thinks she's rolling in money, because I'm, ro I'm rolling in money, money supposedly. Um, mm. You know, everyone thinks that she's got as, you know, as, as much money as I have, which is yeah. ridiculous. People assume that if you're the mother or father of somebody famous, that you must be just rolling in it. So people expect her to live up to, you know, expect to go around to her house and have Moe and Shandon poured down their <laughs> throat. throat. <laughs> In fact, they get beans on toast, you know. Yeah. Um, she, she does, and she, you know, people sort of take advantage. But she's a, a, a human, I don't know. Fair I enough. think it's a failing that we all have. I think we, I've, I've done it, and everybody takes advantage. If, if, if you can, sort of, I used to, when I used to sort of work in the um, Mills Music in Denmark Street, I used to quickly nip home with a couple of uh, music books that I used to steal and things like that. And you do take, I think, when people say, well, don't you mind people taking advantage of you? I say, well, if it's on a small scale, no, because it's just human nature. Yeah, I mean, people always do. Uh, I don't really mind. But she's obviously got uh, a new set of problems to cope with herself, hasn't she? I don't mean she's laden down with it no. or she's on a psychiatrist's couch with it, but... <laughs> no, she's very, she's much more cleverer than you or I or anybody else put together. Like, she constantly amazes me because she's always right, you know. I mean, if. If I meet somebody new, she'll go, oh, don't like him. And I go, he's all, he's all right, or, he, you know, he's trustworthy. And she'll, and she'll always be right. She can, you know, s smell a rat from the word go. That's probably why she's not here now. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks. Never realised the passing hours Of evening showers Sit news hanging In my darkest dreams Strangled by your heart and social scene